Hey everybody, International Master David Proust here, and today we are going to be seeing the aftermath of Fisher Rubinetti. If you haven't seen that video yet, definitely should be watched first. That's a very classic game that Bobby Fisher played, and today we're seeing what kind of an impact that made on other people who were able to see his games. So I had seen that game, and we will start with a game of mine. So I'm white, as we saw last week, very strong move in this position, rook to e1 from Fisher, so I'd seen that game and I actually remembered that move. So after knight bd7, I remembered also that it's important to develop quickly so that I can answer knight c5 with bishop d5. But here my opponent played a move I did not know, which was queen b6. And now I had to do some thinking for myself, right? You have to consider, do you want to play a sacrifice on e6? Do you want to try to come to d5 anyway? Well, bishop d5, you should be able to reason it won't be as strong against queen b6 because black hasn't spent a move on knight c5. You don't have the b4 follow-up. The bishop is defended. There's a good chance black might be able to just ignore bishop d5. So I thought for a while, and I figured out the correct approach here. You want to play knight d5, which will get you a tempo on the queen, right, when your knight comes to d5. But as very often in the Sicilian, before you play knight d5, you want to play a4 first while your knight is here to add to the pressure on b5. And getting black to play b4 increases a lot of your potential. For one thing, this pawn's often hanging. For another thing, you can play c3 to force open the c-file for an attack at some point. So you often want to throw in a4. Now here the point is slightly different, but a4 is still very strong. So knight d5 gets played. e takes d5, e takes d5 check, and now black plays knight e5. You should be familiar by now with the idea that bishop e7, knight f5, is not a good set of moves for black to usually play. Um, they will lose back their piece. But you should also kind of be expecting black to play king to d8, right? Trying to hold on to their piece and just keep their king in the center. But actually, I mean, white has a very strong attack there too. And in this case, black played knight e5, and black has a very, very devious idea to this, which I will now show you even though I didn't fall into it. So don't assume that I played this bad move, f4. The idea for black is that they're castling queenside, letting white win back the piece, and even white is up a pawn after this move. But now, suddenly, white has this bishop placed weirdly, and his king on this diagonal, and black has these really, really powerful counterattacks by putting their bishops on the diagonals towards white's king, who's kind of open. And it's a weird situation, where white would like to play c3 and open a file to attack the black king himself. But black has ample play in this position here. It's totally not the right way for white to go. So the follow-up for white is not f4, but a5 attacking the queen. And now the queen moves, and the point is in this position here to be able to play bishop a4 check and keep the black king from castling anyway instead of playing f4 to regain your piece. But before you play bishop a4 check, bishop e3 is strong with the idea of trying to basically trap the black queen or get some kind of winning tactic off of knight e6 or knight c6 or something like that. So the black queen has to move here. She retreats, and now white plays bishop a4 check. Black plays king to d8, and now we've kept the black king from castling, and we're ready to try to capture the knight on e5. By the way, black could also have played king to e7 here, but that you will see in the very next game. So king to d8, f4, the knight moves, and now knight to c6, check. In general, this isn't like the most fun move to play for white because you're trading off a black bishop that was kind of blocked in and not very good. But it's actually very valuable to do this in this case because you get your bishop into c6, which is which is just really, really good for sort of controlling the black king, and you're starting to try and play bishop to b6 at some point. So knight takes e3, rook takes e3. To some extent, you're threatening to just take this rook, and then material's about equal. The other thing you want to do is lift your rook to a4 and take this pawn on b4 and get this rook into the game, and that's why the trade on c6 freed this square here for your rook. So black moved the rook. I played queen d4, and what I expected here was that black would play the rook to e7, 
right, trying to deal with this file before I get my rooks going on it. And then I would play queen b6, check, and queen c7, rook takes rook, bishop takes rook, queen takes a6. And now suddenly the point of what white is doing is that this bishop anchored here sort of cuts the board in half and controls the queening square. The white queen moves out of the way and you just walk your a-pawn down the board and win. It's just a beautiful positional win for white with this bishop on this great square. So that was the idea. However, the game ended differently when my opponent instead played rook to c7, trying to prevent me from being able to capture this a6 pawn and then walk the, the pawn down the board. But in trying to prevent my plan, black walked into a different tactic. What does white do here? You got it. Queen f6 check and pawn takes rook e8 checkmate. So um, because white was making these sort of unusual positional threats to win on the queen side positionally, black actually missed sort of a more obvious kind of idea for white to just checkmate down the open file. Okay, so that is game number one. Now check out this next game here. So this position here we had in our last game. And actually after I played that game, somebody told me eventually like, hey, did you realize that Michael Adams played that basically that same game once? And no, I had not seen Adams' game, but I felt really good when I found this game. Adam Sadler, two of the strongest British grandmasters, playing against each other, replicating all the moves up to here of my game, right? 16, 17 moves of playing the same moves as Michael Adams. That was one of the best feelings of my life, and I owe it to Bobby since obviously I got the idea for how to play this game from studying his games, which Adams had also studied. And uh, Sadler played king e7 instead of king d8, and f4, of course, next, right? White's going to try and pry open this file and win back material. Now that he knows that black's not going to castle queenside anyway. So white gets back his piece right here. And puts the queen on an aggressive square. And then retreats the bishop here. So in this position, black is up exactly one pawn. So material is very close. But obviously they're losing with the king sort of blocking in their, their development abilities. Um, Sadler played g6 in order to develop his bishop to g7, bring his rook out, and then walk his king back. Um, as good a plan as any. But here, Adams has a great move. You can pause the video and try and find it if you like. Rook takes e5 check, destroying the pawn structure. That's exactly the kind of move you should be looking for in positions like this, by the way. You've already got so many pieces on aggressive squares, right? What do you lack? what you lack is enough open lines to just check, 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 checkmate, right? So, sacks the rook, and Sadler just moves his king away. I mean, you can see immediately that if he takes, takes here, at the very worst, Adams could take back the rook, right? And in this position, white would be up a pawn and still threatening queen h7 check. But it might be even worse for black if white could win with rook to f1 here or bishop to b3. In any case, correct not to take the rook. Sadler plays king to f7. And now Adams moves his queen to f3. So he keeps that pawn from taking his rook now. And he's going for bishop b3. You know, he's trying to gang up on this knight on d5 now. So the knight moves away. And he checks him, king moves over, right, since the diagonal couldn't be blocked and the king had no other legal moves. And now another terrific move, sacrifice to try and open and checkmate the black king. Check. King can't move anywhere, so he has to take it. That opens a line. King f7, and you see the king now has open lines on all sides of him, two open files, completely trapping him. Bishop b3, check is played. Any check could be a mate once the king can't move, really, right? And Sadler blocks with the knight. Now, try to find the next move as well. How does Adams finish this off? The key is he sacks the rook because he absolutely needs this bishop to be able to take away the f7 square from the black king. Okay, if he took with his bishop, of course he would eventually win this game, right? 
because in this position here, what cause does black have for hope? Right? It's equal material, and their position is just garbage, and white's pieces are developed, and black's aren't. But rook takes d5 is even better, and black just resigned right away because of the fact that white now has a bishop to keep the black king from hiding on f7, a queen to chase him out this way. King comes out, white can check him like this. If the king comes to d7, then bishop e6 wins the queen. And if the king comes to d8, white has this diagonal piece to corral him. And so ultimately, I mean, he's always going to be forced onto that square and at least lose his queen. And, you know, also checkmate is coming in a move or two. So that is another great game to show you how to sort of attack and just systematically break down the opponent's defenses, which pieces you need, how to take away squares from the opponent's king. So two totally sweet games, but obviously completely derivative from what Fisher did. So in a sense, Fisher, with his great game, helped to create these games which come after, and that's how it works with the development of chess ideas. Great ideas can lead to many great games that develop out of variations around them. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you around on chess.com.